Okay, well, hello and welcome, everybody. My name is Steve Teresi. I'm the VP of Technical Services here at JL Audio. Um, as I'm joined with Rob and Kevin here, as usual, Rob from Southern California, Kevin from the, the greater Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania area. Today's session is actually kind of a neat one. We're going to talk about like uh, high value system design or, or cost conscious system design. We're going to focus on our W0s and our uh, JD amplifiers, uh, two uh, somewhat entry level type products as uh, they tend to be referred to. But I, uh, Kevin's going to lead us through and kind of go through how to actually pick out quality components, uh, even on a budget. And uh, instead of me it was, uh, like delaying him, I'll simply interrupt him a little bit later. Kevin, why don't you take it away? <laughs> All righty. So when we talk about cost conscious or high value systems, really the big thing is, is efficiency. Efficiency is going to be your friend. When we take a look at subwoofers like the W0V3s, can, considering that they are a subwoofer, they are a fairly efficient subwoofer. They work really well in lower power situations. You don't need to have a thousand watt amplifier to run these uh, subwoofers. They run very, very well on lower powered uh, amplifiers. And that's great because then that's less you have to worry about with your electrical system and a lot of the other things that you may have to upgrade when you are looking at some of the higher end systems uh, that are out there. So really efficiency is on your side. And we're gonna go through and talk about those W0V3s, the JD amplifiers, get into some of the design aspect of everything, even talk a little bit about system setup. So once you get your system designed and laid out and, and installed, we'll talk a little bit about just a couple little things that you may need to do to get that system up and running properly and efficiently. So starting off with our W0V3 family. They come in a few different sizes. We've got a 10, a 12, and a 15 W0 on there. And Sorry, <laughs> a 15 W0 V3. The cool thing is, is that all of them come in any uh, impedance that you want, as long as it is four out. So <laughs> the nice thing is... is Handling your best out. Henry Ford. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> So they come in a four ohm, uh, single four ohm voice coil, which is really, really nice. It makes it easy to pair up with the amplifiers. They work very well in pairs on the JD mono amplifiers. So they were set up that way for a reason. So we have the 10, we have the 12, and we have the 15. And some differences between them, obviously besides size, is the amount of displacement that they're able to put out there. And when we talk about these, if you have the space and you are really, really looking for some output, that 15W0V3 is an excellent, excellent option on there. And it, it's a great piece. When we take a look at the uh, piston displacement, we're at 122-ish uh, cubic inches compared to 67. So it's about double the output. So you need two of the 12s to equal one of those 15s and almost three of the uh, 10s there to equal one of those 15s. Yes, Steve. What is displacement? <laughs> so displacement, and that's a great question. So what displacement is, is we're taking the excursion of the driver. So how far that driver is moving in and out and we're also taking the square inches of the cone area and we are figuring out how much air that driver has the potential to move. So and potential is the key word there, depending on your enclosure and all of that stuff, the amplifier um, and all of that good stuff that is on there. But it is the potential of air that that speaker can move. And these are all calculated per single driver. So when we take a look at that, that is a single 10, a single 12, and a single 15 that we're displaying up there mathematically. And so the, the we're not looking at... Go ahead, Rob. Oh, sorry, sorry, we're not looking at how much space in the enclosure the driver is displacing. Right. It's right. The actual air in your, the air that the woofer when moving can displace. Right, and it's a it's a good potential indicator of the output potential of that driver or drivers. Um, and as Kevin's broken it down, it's per driver in this case. So you could see that the 10 inch um, has a certain amount of output potential looking at this displacement value. And then it gets larger as you go to the 12 inch and even larger when you go to the 15. And it is a combination of not only the piston size, but how far it can move as well. More excursion, larger piston, more displacement, more potential output. So those numbers can help to give you an idea of what uh, might be possible, assuming everything else lines up. Yeah, that 15's got a little bit more excursion capability on there than the uh, 10 and 12, but that 
piston size just is is hard to make up for there. So Indeed. it definitely is able to move a ton of air. And that's something to think about whenever you are designing and laying out your system. What can fit your specific vehicle? Not all vehicles can fit a 15 in them. In fact, but, you know, a lot of smaller vehicles, you probably can't fit that in the enclosure that would be proper for that subwoofer in those vehicles. So you just need to keep that in mind. Pick a subwoofer that's going to not only fit your application, but also fit what is going or what is going to fit in the vehicle itself. So some of the technologies that we have in the W0V3 line, um, dynamic motor analysis or DMA, we use this on all of our subwoofers and our speakers all the way back to the original W7 um, is when we came out with a DMA optimized motors. And basically what we're doing is it's a finite element uh, analysis and we're able to look at all of the different parts of the subwoofers motor and be able to see kind of how they're going to mesh with one another and how they're going to work together. And then we would go ahead and make one of those motors and listen to that speaker and see how it works and make some changes here and there and go uh, go forward. The nice thing about the, uh, the DMA or the dynamic motor analysis is it gets us a little bit closer to that ender product faster. So it's really, really nice to be able to go in and see. And one of the things that's a little bit different about DMA is it actually looks at things not only in a static position, but it looks at how the driver reacts in motion too. And that's, it's a proprietary uh, system to uh, JL Audio that we're able to go in and model those uh, motor assemblies prior to building them and just seeing how they're gonna react and how everything's gonna work together. So once the motor's all uh, put together, we need to figure out ways to keep everything cool. Um, heat is just a huge, huge, huge byproduct of power going into the speaker, especially when we're dealing with uh, subwoofers on there. The amount of work that they are doing um, back there is, uh, is, is a lot. And, and that byproduct of that is heat. Um, the W0V3 uses what we call an elevated cooling uh, frame or elevated frame cooling. And there's a channel actually between the frame and the top plate now allows air to just come directly into that perfect spot on the voice coil right up top there and because that uh, heat is being generated from the voice coil getting that cool air directly into it um, especially at that top really does help tremendously we also do use pull venting on the bottom of these which you'll kind of have to take into account when you are looking at your enclosure you can't butt them up completely against the bottom of the enclosure. You need to have a little space in that. If you are doing a box, like one of the ones that we have uh, designed and laid out, you don't have to worry about any of that. We've taken it all into account and given plenty of space. These do work in both ported and sealed enclosure. So your W0V3, you can put it in a ported enclosure or you can put it in a sealed enclosure. It will work in both. And we have those plans uh, laid out. You can also call tech support if you need a specific enclosure designed for your application. Maybe this box won't fit in a certain dimension in your vehicle. Then you can give us a call. Um, the guys are great. They'll be able to help you out and design one that will fit your specific needs or, uh, or help the retailer out in getting one designed to fit your specific needs on there too. What's really cool about that elevated frame cooling that Kevin was showing on the slide before, I know we were showing a W1V3 on that just because I think it's probably the only image we had a cutaway of. <laughs> it's not just that you have, you know, this gap between the motor and the frame. It's strategically designed where the frame meets the motor that it creates almost like a little channel. It's a high compression channel. So it's not just like airs slowly moving back and cross, uh, uh, across the top plate. You know, the pumping action of the motor with the way we design our frames, it compresses all of that air. And if you guys, if you ever played with a, you know, a compressed air can, when you spray it, it's cold. The can gets cold. And that's the same thing by us designing the frame where it meets the motor to compress that air across the top plate. Not only is it moving more air, but it's cooler air that then allows it to, in a more efficient manner, cool the motor and the voice coil, in addition to some of the other cooling, uh, you know, 
tips and tricks and cool things we have that Kevin's talked about. So just but, for clarity, it doesn't get quite as cold as a compressed air can. <laughs> no, <laughs> it does not. But, it's, but the air being it, it, it is, is compressed, subtle, it's going to be cooler than just in terms of temperature. Yes, air <laughs> wafting <laughs> over the top of the motor. <laughs> And the, the big thing is, is the placement of that, too. We're getting cooler air into the top side of that voice coil. And then the pull vent helps it come up from underneath and creating a nice, nice uh, environment for dissipating that heat out of that space. All righty. So moving on to the JD amplifiers. There's uh, four uh, amplifiers in the JD line. We have one full range amplifier. Uh, it's four channel. And then we have three different monos in there too. The 404 is really a nice, nice amplifier. When you take a look at the power ratings of it, it's 75 by or 75 watts by four at four ohms. So you're getting a lot of power out of this little guy, um, which is very, very nice to your mid range, your coaxials, components, whatever you want to use up there. But it matches up very, very nicely um, to C1 and C2 speakers for running those full range. And then the monos, you've got that 250 uh, slash one all the way up to the 1000 slash one in the uh, in that JD line. And they are coincide with their part numbers. That JD 1000 slash one monoblock amplifier is 1000 watts. It is a nice little powerhouse. Um, my personal favorite out of the group, and you guys can say your personal favorites if you want to, but I like the 500 slash one. It really kind of fits that in between uh, line there. You don't need to do a lot of power upgrades and you don't have to worry about a, a larger current draw on there, but it's still just that stout little amplifier um, and works very, very well. <laughs> Sorry, I was muted. I couldn't get over there. I can't. I can't argue with you on the 501. I mean, in terms of price and performance and physical size, it's it's magical. I think it's really really good. I am a little partial to the thousand because I like to kind of scale things up a little bit. Yeah, um, I, I I think for if we're talking about value, not necessarily you know cheap by any stretch, but in terms of value, getting that thousand if you're trying to do a bigger system, it, it's. The, the scaling up of cost compared to the scaling up of power, it's not twice the price, right. but it is twice the power. So I like that from a value proposition. Yeah, that is a good point. That is a good point. So Steve is the 15W0V3 guy with the 1001. Not going to lie, I mean, that's a magical thing. You get hey, If you could get a pair of 15W3s and one of those thousands, yeah. if that's in your budget the right way, and Kevin will explain that as well when we talk about system design, about allocation of funds uh, to make a proper system design, that is freaking awesome. The amount, I mean, it's going to sound really good. It's going to have tons of output too. and Ain't nothing wrong with that. Nope. Just make sure you match up your front stage or your main stage with the uh, with the subwoofers there, because you're gonna have a lot of output to keep up with those factory speakers if that's what you're trying to do. <laughs> yeah. Not just factory speakers, but I mean, even if you're doing an aftermarket system, you have to have a balance. I've seen yeah. systems with two, three thousand watts on the subwoofers running a four by seventy five watt amplifier for for you know aftermarket speakers, and if you're gonna tell me. 3,000 watts of bass and 75 watts to your, to yeah, your mid range no. and your high frequencies. But you're closer to the speakers. That probably leads <laughs> the damaged speakers at some point. Trying to keep. I, I love the people that say, "Yeah, but I'm going to keep the level down." No, you're not. No, <laughs> that never happens. You, know, you can't lie to me. I know. <laughs> yeah, that's like uh, having a supercharged LS motor in your vehicle and saying, "I'm not going to put my foot all the way down on that pedal." Right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I never do that. <laughs> So some of the technologies that are in the JD line, um, next D um, switching technology, it is just an enhancement for that uh, class D switching circuitry. Um, it is really the, the basis of most of the JL audio amplifiers. In fact, we've even got a V2 of that in some of our higher, uh, higher end amplifiers. And really the basis is it's high, high fidelity, Great, great power and efficiency with still keeping that chassis nice and compact, um, especially on those JD amplifiers. 
automatic turn on capabilities. You've got your standard 12 volt uh, DC trigger. You've got DC offset signal sensing. So depending on how you're integrating the amplifier into the system, you do have multiple options for turn on. If your system doesn't have a hardwired uh, 12 volt trigger, you can grab uh, DC offset or signal sensing turn on capabilities on there. But if you do have the ability, I personally always go for the remote wire. Just uh, just my personal uh, opinion on that one. If you got it, use it. Yep, yep, exactly. So the differential balance input is a great uh, little technology. It's actually on all JL Audio amplifiers on there, even all the way up to the HD, VXIs, and all of that. It helps reduce the possibility for noise into the system. There's high and low settings, which will help with both aftermarket and OEM integration. Um, and it will handle up to eight volts of input on the high end. So if you're doing an OEM integration, you can go up to eight volts on there. If you need to go hi uh, higher on that, or if your OEM system has more voltage than that, then the LOC22 is going to be your friend. And you'll just have to make sure that you budget that into your system also there with the integration portion of it. So getting into the system design, the kind of the fun stuff here and taking a look at, uh, at how we kind of put JD and, uh, and W0V3 together. When you look at the power ratings and the continuous power ratings of the subwoofers, you want to match an amplifier to those continuous uh, power ratings. We have them all laid out very, very nicely on the uh, website where you start getting into red and black. When you get into the black, range on the power ratings of your subwoofers, you don't want to be there. So you want to make sure that you are in the green and uh, in yellow areas there when you look at those power ratings. We catch a lot of flack for that, that power range. People just want to know what number to use. Well, we, we also know that that doesn't always work that well. You can't just say a single number because it does depend on the listener profile as well. And we also know that there's more than one type of amplifier. So you might be dealing with a range of amplifiers. And that, that sliding scale from you know green to yellow to red to black, um, I, I like to say the black is going to represent what your coils will look like if you play it too long, right? <laughs> Very nice and black from the excessive heat. What we're trying to do is guide you towards proper choices for reliability and performance. And sometimes it seems almost backwards. So if you're an SPL type listener, someone that really wants to play loud and hard and you know just really pound on it, we're going to tell you to stay away from the right side of that power chart. We're going to tell you to stay more towards the green. And that may seem counterintuitive, but we know that a heavier listener, someone that's really good at de demanding a ton of performance from this system, is going to be playing it harder more often than a, a more normal user, someone that just wants a, a nice balance between really good performance and really good you know, reliability. In those cases, you can go yellow or maybe even closer to the red. Obviously, stay away from the black whenever you possibly can. But you need to be honest with yourself. If you're going to be an insane listener, i.e. like a Glenn Savage type person, if you're going to be that guy, you, you want to stay away from the black because otherwise you're going to have problems and no one wants problems. No, nah, no. Nah. <clears throat> so the other way around, if you've chosen rather than uh, if you've chosen an amplifier um, already or if you've chosen your subwoofers, just make sure that they match one another. And it's a nice thing that 501 kind of split or the yeah, the JD 500 slash one kind of fits in between and will work with the 10s very well, the 12s very well. Um, when you start getting into the 15s and you'll probably want to bump up to that JD 1000 uh, slash one on there. When you are looking at your subwoofer and your amplifier, don't forget the rest of the system. Just because you purchase your subwoofers and your amplifier doesn't mean that they're going to magically appear installed into your vehicle for the cost of those two components. You don't forget the rest of the system. You need an enclosure. You need an amplifier install kit. The amplifier kit doesn't come with RCA cables. You're going to need those also. And sometimes there's other install needs, like maybe you do need an LOC uh, 22. Um, maybe you want to add some sound uh, deadening in there, uh, different speaker wire, et cetera. So you do have some uh, other costs in there that are associated with it. So don't blow your budget just on the components themselves. Now, like I said, they do work very, very well in pairs off of the uh, JD amplifiers. And that bass upgrade is usually the 
first one that somebody does. Um, that's the one that has kind of that most impact uh, of your upgrades. And the nice thing is, is that if you can't afford two of them, or, or maybe two of them aren't in the budget, you can do a single, and then you can add a second one down the road, um, because they do work well in pairs. So you can build that system up. And don't be afraid to take your time and build that system up as you're being able to enjoy each step as you go while uh, while listening to to it in your vehicle there so it's a really good point there kevin and the most likely add-on system is always going to be a sub amp and a subwoofer right that that's what most people are looking for uh the vast majority of factory systems really lack in that lower couple of octaves and that that enhancement is really sought after and if you're really on a budget and that's all you can do I think Kevin's suggestion there of just getting, I would push towards the 501 again, you know, that value proposition. It's not, it's double the power from a 250, but not double the price and get a single woofer um, with that different impedance. It's not going to really be overdriven. Um, and then you have the ability to add that second four ohm woofer, get that two ohm load and get the most out of that amplifier. That's a really nice upgrade for the future to build that system as you go. That first upgrade though, is almost always going to be add the sub. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I'll let Kevin keep going. I don't want to take anything away. Yep. So here we are with adding the sub in there. I've uh, got the 500 or JD 500 slash one, just like Steve recommended. Uh, we get there. I was able to get both of the 12W0V3s on here. But again, I don't need to do both of them at one time. I can do the single and then build the second one in. So let's build on that, though. So what would our next step be from having this system uh, laid out? For me, it would be probably changing the factory speakers and replacing them with something like a C1 uh, coax. So it's a very nice... Uh, uh, efficient driver. It's got a real tweeter on it compared to probably what most of the uh, ones that you're actually replacing in there. And they do work out very well. I mean, you got to think about this and this is really cool. And I, Steve brought this up to me about four years ago, and it has stuck with me for a very four years at least. So a um, very long time. <laughs> those of you guys that know me sticking in my brain, there is not the easiest thing. So Subwoofers, they account for, say, what, 20 to 80 hertz for the most part, right? Well, that's two octaves. You got 20 to 40 and then 40 to 80. That's two octaves. That's only 20%, give or take, of what is in our human hearing range. The rest of that 80% is in the full range speakers. So adding those components or coaxials into the system are really going to make a big difference. Yes, we get that big impact from the subwoofers, but we're missing out on the rest of the 80%. So finishing out the entire system is extremely, extremely important. Balance can... system design. <laughs> right. <laughs> See, Steve, I listened to you, man. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, four years ago you did anyway, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so from there, my uh, upgrade would be adding in a full range amplifier there. So I've added in my JD 400 slash four, and I've added them on two pairs of C2 650Xs. Um, you can add them in uh, or add that amplifier onto the C1s also. Um, just when I did this upgrade, I wanted to upgrade my speakers too. A little bit uh, nicer sounding speaker, a little bit better uh, power handling on that guy too. So, and then I still have my JD 500 slash one on my two 12W0. Uh, v3s on there so it's a great great little little upgrade don't forget that little uh wanker knob there <laughs> i did i forgot about the knob there so the little uh the little knob there will actually get into that too that's another accessory it's not needed right off the bat however you can add that uh the bass boost knob onto the system when your budget allows it you don't need to spring for that right up front now it probably will save you a little bit of installation money by springing for it up front because they're able to just run that uh, along when they're running the power wires and everything else however it is not required at the uh, at that initial point so if you don't have that in the budget you can go ahead and add it later but just realize that you are probably going to get another hour of labor onto that guy to be able to install it there see you unmuted like you wanted to well say I, I was going to say that you know uh whenever when, when i'm trying to like when, when i put my retail brain in 
I, I try to think of what I can do to help my customer be more efficient with their spend. You know, they're going to be buying equipment and I'm very confident that what I'm going to recommend to them is going to perform to or beyond their expectation. And if I do my job right and I set them up correctly, they're going to be back to enhance that system at some other point. So I would encourage to to, to make that spend, to, to spend the money, um, to put that, 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 at least the wires, run the wires through, you know, uh, scale up your power kit. You know, so don't use the bare minimum size wire. Because if you want to upgrade, you're going to have to run on the wire again. Yeah. So spend a little more up front because it'll save you on the back end. Because, again, you know, my goal is always to meet or exceed expectations. And if I do that well, I know my customer will come back and say, hey, can I add that uh, four-channel amplifier on those C2s? Yeah, we can go ahead and do that. We've already run the wire, so we're ready to go. We'll be out of here in no time. You know, Pay me for the new stuff, and you'll be on your way in just a short period of time. And I think that's a really nice thing that we, we planned for that, you know. Again, if you don't have the extra money up front, that's something you could always do later. You know, it's just a, a for me, it's efficiency. So. Yeah, I agree with that. And I kind of think of it as two different categories when I'm designing even my own personal system. And when I'm laying out my own personal systems, I kind of lay out product that is easily switchable and product that is not. And the stuff that is not, I make sure I go full in <laughs> on the stuff that is not easily replaceable or may cost a little bit more time down the road um, yeah. rather than, you know, a, a subwoofer enclosure. If you don't like your subwoofer enclosure, yeah, it might cost you a hundred bucks or something like that to, to change your subwoofer enclosure, but you can do it in 15 minutes, right? And it's not that big right. of a deal. So um, I look at it where if you're running power wire or something like that, it's going to take you some time to be able to go through there and swap that out properly. I don't like replacing product. I like adding to. Or adding to, yeah. <laughs> so, all righty. Um, so let's talk about this system here. And this is a great little system. And this is kind of going back to the system design uh, on a budget. They should be thought of as building blocks. And this is really, really a great start because it's giving us a full system here, right? So we have coaxials for up front and you can swap it out for a C1 component if you wanted to on there. And we have a single 10W0 uh, or 10W0V3-4, uh, and we're going to pretty much run that amplifier to its potential, and it's going to work very, very, very well. This is maximizing our product and maximizing our dollars at this point. Now, the nice thing is, is when you lay this out in this three-way application, we're going to bridge that amplifier to the subwoofer, and then we're going to run our coaxials on the front two channels, probably in our front two doors. Now, the nice thing is, is upgrading this. If we want to upgrade this, it is very easy. We can add in a five or a JD 500 slash one amplifier and a second uh, subwoofer. So we're able to go in and build that. And then that gives us two channels opened up on our four channel amplifier. Now we can add another set of coaxials into the system. It is a great, great start and great, great uh, building blocks when we take a look at system design and being able to just get our foot in the door, have something that we're going to be able to sit in the vehicle and really, really enjoy li uh, listening too. You know, when we talk about cost conscious or high value, th this slide here, I think is awesome. Um, like Evan was saying that it, it, everything in this particular package can be used for the next package. And even the one after that, there, there is no reason that you'd have to you know, return that amplifier and swap it out for another one. That one can last for several generations of systems. The subwoofer, if you design the enclosure right, or find an enclosure that you could physically fit two of them in there, then you don't have to worry about swapping out a sub box either. A lot of this is completely what I consider like module. We just keep adding onto it as as the the needs of the listener or the customer or whatever um, changes over time. And again, dialed in correctly, this system would actually sound really, really great. And you can imagine that it, there's really only, I know it looks like more, but there's three components to it. There's an amp, there's a pair of speakers and a subwoofer. There are some other unspoken things like power wire, things of that nature, which are all part of this. But again, none of that has to change if we do that correctly up front. So I, I use this slide in my mind as that beginning system. So no less than this, because this covers everything. You've got your main speakers, you've got your subwoofer. It's very well balanced. This would sound really good. And if you're new to audio, I would do something like this. It's not a high investment. 
Yeah, I know it's going to cost some money, but it's not a huge investment. But it's also going to give you a balanced, sound, and great performance. Instead of you know a typical thing, what would happen? You spend all your money on a subwoofer and then realize, wait a minute, I don't have an amplifier. I don't have power wire. I don't have a box. I have no way of getting any performance out of this, but now I have no more money. That's not good. This particular system may cost less than just a really high-end woofer would cost, but it's also a more balanced system. And when I think of cost conscious or high value, I think of something that's going to exceed expectations and cover everything in a very balanced way so that if I want more, I don't want more because I'm missing something. I want more because I like it so much. I just want even more of it now. So that, that's I like this slide. This to me is where things start. I do. And it's funny that you mentioned that because for this system here, Steve, you could buy this entire system or you could purchase a 12W6 V3. And then oh, the 63 is awesome. Why wouldn't you buy that? Well, because you are going to have a 12 W6 V3 in a cardboard box that it came in <laughs> with exactly. nothing able to play. Right. <laughs> you have no performance from it other than a really good paperweight. Right. right. But you can tell all your friends that you have a 12 W6 V3. Bragging rights. This is true. This you, is true. You just but, can't listen to it. <laughs> you can tap on it. <laughs> the question will come in well how does it sound you'll be like i don't know i couldn't afford anything else to go with it <laughs> that's it and that's the thing and you know that's where system design is so critical so i mean i'm excited about the products we've talked about but i think system design is uh i don't know we should probably consider getting into that huh yeah. well, we, well, jeff we, smith added this system with a single vented enclosure is awesome <laughs> nice. Yeah, use that ported enclosure to help get a little more output yeah, if needed. Absolutely. This is a great way to start and have a nice, well balanced setup that'll still get down and be fun. It, without a doubt. Without a doubt. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, absolutely. So let's get into some of the install side of things here. Steve mentioned a great thing called Power Wire. You, deem, you do need it. wire to run from your battery back to the amplifier. If your battery's in the back, great. You'll still need a wire to go from that battery to the, uh, to the amplifier. And then you'll need a return path, which is your ground on there also. Um, there's really two types of wire out there. CCA, copper cladded uh, aluminum. Um, it's pros of it. It's, it's a lower cost. Um, but the problem is, is it's about half the conductivity of pure copper. Now, that's not a terrible thing. Um, you may just need to buy a thicker wire if you want to use CCA. So you can use it. You would just need double the thickness of it to equal the same conductivity as pure copper or, uh, or uh, oxygen-free copper. That we, I have to uh, check the math about. on that, but you definitely need a thicker wire than Yeah, not, than not twice wire. as thick, okay. but, but okay. it will definitely be thicker for sure. So but, OFC is nice. Um, it has increased uh, conductivity on there and not also increased corrosion resistance. So if you're using this in an application where it may get a little damp in there, maybe the seal on your trunk isn't that great, or maybe you're using it in a different application application, it works out very, very well. Now, pay attention to wire and the uh, the available amperage that it's able to conduct. That is the big thing. If you only look at gauges that I've seen cop or I've seen wire out there with maybe thicker jacketing and they still call it a four gauge wire, there's not all wires created equal. Let's say that. That's and pay true. attention to what um, what it'll be able to uh, conduct on there along with the gauge of wire and that will get you in the correct direction. And I know a company that makes really, really great wiring uh, kits that uh, that will steer you in the right direction too. So to, to summarize what Kevin's sharing is the gauge of the wire, of course, is not not important. In other words, it is important, but the type of the wire is more important. What's really th th what what we're really looking for is conductivity. Yeah. We have to get a little electrons from one point to the other, and the easier they can get there, the less resistance and loss that you wind up with. So although CCA may save you some money in terms of the actual purchase price, it's also compromising for a given gauge of wire. It's going to compromise that conductivity. And the chart that we have up here now is assuming real copper, 100% copper for a single run. In other words, from the, the energy source, i.e. battery or alternator in the front of a vehicle uh, for car audio to back where the amplifiers typical, typically will be located. And we've went ahead and highlighted um, the most common things that you're likely to see in most vehicles, you know, 13 to 20 feet. And you'll see that a four gauge wire between 60 amps 
at 100 amps from 13 feet to about 20 feet, a four gauge wire is going to cover you pretty well. Now, when you start looking at amplifiers like the 404 or the 251 or 501, you can look at the, the fuse rating to get a rough idea of how much amperage you may need for that. It's not the right way of looking at it, but it's an easy way of looking at it. And you can kind of add up those fuse values to get an idea of what size wire you may need. There are more scientific ways, but if you're just looking for a quick and dirty method, that's one that you can use. And you'll probably find, I haven't done the math yet today, but I think Kevin just put a link in our, our um, in our chat. I don't know if he put it out there. I put uh, it in our the... chat so Rob can uh, copy it. Oh, okay. Into the Facebook um, world. <laughs> but you could determine uh, all of that, that information and buy uh, an appropriate conductivity wire, right? Four gauge pure copper or possibly a two gauge CCA or something like that. Um, uh, Kevin kind of made a mention that, you know, JL Audio does offer a range of different power kits that come with a bunch of accessories. And we do offer some CCA wire, to be honest with you. Um, and it's a different gauge. So we don't even focus on gauge. We focus on that conductivity. We have a, a 30 amp kit and a 60 amp kit. Amperage. That's what we care about, that, that current capacity. So those are some things to look at when you're looking at power kits. So. Yep. Awesome. Sorry for the rant. <laughs> no, yeah, perfect. <laughs> perfect. I think right also now. you have to make sure is if you're not sure if you're going to be close to the limit, always yeah. go bigger. Yeah, gives you room to upgrade later on, whether it's 100%. adding more amps or moving to a bigger amplifier. You know, you don't want to shortchange yourself because then you're just going to rob yourself from performance. So if you're on the fence, you can go either way. Go big. It's worth it. Totally yeah, agree. It's, uh, you. Going bigger is not going to hinder anything no. down the road. So you don't have to worry about going too big with uh, with your wiring kits and stuff like that. They will work perfectly fine, um, even better. The problem is, is when you start getting too small and then heat can be generated and, uh, and we don't want to be generating heat from our uh, power wires or anything like that strains on connections you want to make sure all of that stuff is done properly too um, and make sure that your uh, connections are all tight and everything is secured right. so let's get into speaker installation so i know we're talking about c1 c2 jd amplifier but in a, in a lot of times we don't get into the uh the actual speaker installation when we talk about these things right well it's again another one of those things that is very very important steve kind of mentioned about hey while you're in there and you're doing this just do it because the cost isn't going to be that much at that point in time so going in and taking care of your doors and making sure your speakers are installed properly and all of that good stuff is going to help the performance of any speaker that you put in there. Um, whether it's even amplified or not amplified, it's going to help you out. But as you start building that system, it is going to help you out more and more. When you add an amplifier in there and your speaker's moving a little bit more, you're gonna notice a little bit better performance if your door is properly treated. Now you don't have to go full to the wall, do what your budget allows you, but do something in there and make sure that you are taking care of that. Make sure that your speakers got a good uh, mounting ring. I know C1s do come with a lot of different uh, trim rings to be able to mount them in different applications. If you don't have one that fits your application, make sure that you're getting that piece mainly out of plastic or starboard or something like that. Wood rings after a while, especially when you live uh, where I do <laughs> or where Steve <laughs> does, they start to swell and shrink and swell and shrink and next thing you know you have one screw holding your speaker in um never one seen rusted screw <laughs> <laughs> so i love what kevin sharing with us here uh that first one is one that is often overlooked uh, the damping material or you know deadening stuff or whatever that this is that, that stick on stuff typically that you know we put on metal surfaces to stop it from vibrating a lot of the manufacturers of this material will claim that you'll get 3 db or x number of db more output of course they're lying they're not giving you any more output. They're reducing the loss of output. Of course, that ultimately means you're getting more out of it. So I guess you could look at it the other way. Um, but you know what they're telling you is that when you don't use materials like they're offering, you will lose some of the energy that that speaker is capable of. And, and by getting rid of the loss, you wind up with a gain. And that's kind of where they're coming from. It's not actually, uh, you can't gain anything 
without electronics in some way. Well, there's other ways, but yeah, in general, you get what I mean. That if, if you could stop the vibration of the door panel, you'll wind up with more music instead of vibration. And almost everything else that's on that list is intended to do the same thing: get more stuff from what you're putting in there, from the speaker that you're you're purchasing. And I've never actually done the math or actually you know a direct comparison because it would be way too challenging to do this. But I think, and if you think through this whole process, that instead of spending a lot of money on a door speaker and not doing any of this stuff, I'd rather buy a less expensive speaker and do all of this stuff. And I would, I'm pretty certain that the less expensive speaker done correctly with all this stuff would outperform the more expensive speaker if you don't do any of this stuff. And like I said, it's all about balance. It's all about making sure that you're you're allocating your budget accordingly. So if you're looking at a C1 or a C2 level speaker, then do a little bit of damping material. Do some work to make sure that the back wave of the speaker is protected from coming through and, and canceling out on the front side you know, by, by closing off any openings. And then properly mount the speaker. Use a nice plastic ring or starboard if you can afford it. That gets a little expensive. A gasket to make sure that it doesn't vibrate. And a... Uh, you can, uh, there's, a, I think they're called fast rings or something like that. They're foam rings that you put in front of the speaker to help couple it to the door panel so that all the energy comes through into the listening area. All of this is going to get the most performance from that new purchase of your door speaker. And going back to my frugal methods of doing it first, right the first time, taking some of these door panels off, I don't want to say it's hard, but there's a lot of stuff that goes into it. The screws have to be found, the panels have to be popped off, and those little plastic things break all the damn time. So it's really annoying to have to go back and forth by taking on and off these door panels. So when you're going to go in there, spend a little bit of money, get the install done right, your speakers will sound better, you don't have to keep going back in there. Just, it's worth it. It's really, really worth it. So please do that. So. I agree. And, and, and when we look at the you know, the cost of some of this stuff, buying a small square of uh, matting and putting it behind the speaker and putting a fast ring on there. You're not talking about hundreds and hundreds of dollars. No, it's like 2% of your purchase. <laughs> I mean, it's like nothing. <laughs> it's nothing. And and it will really help out and gain some performance. Absolutely. There for you, so. Absolutely. And just so you know, we don't sell any of that stuff. This is just <laughs> honesty, right? You know, we're not trying to sell anything here. All righty. So getting into system setup here. So once you've got everything installed and everything laid out um, in the uh, in the vehicle, there are some adjustments that we need to go in and make. Um, one of them is setting up the input sensitivity on there. The input sensitivity that you see on the amplifier is not a volume knob or anything like oh, that. Come on, it works just like it. I turn it up. It's louder. <laughs> I could go on for about an hour of this uh, soapbox that I've got sitting here next to me. But I uh, and it doesn't matter if it's at fifty percent or seventy-five percent. That is not how it works. <laughs> right. <laughs> So you need to make sure that this is set properly. The nice thing is, is that we've given you a nice clipping indicator that is going to illuminate when you hit that point of the amplifier that is, uh, that is starting to go south on you there, starting to put out an output that is not, uh, not good for the speakers or anything like that, or saying the amplifier is trying to do too much work for the input that is coming in on it. So Ultimately, we want to make sure is, is getting the most out of the amplifier for the amount of signal that's coming in. Yeah. And if you don't set it right, sure, you can put a little signal in and get to the maximum of the amplifier. But then if you put more signal in, you'll overdrive the output of the amp. And on the other side, which almost never happens, is if you set it too low, you put maximum signal to the input and you still don't get full output from the amp. And that's where everyone goes back and starts turning the dial. Hey, look, it's like a volume control. I turn it up, it gets louder. What you need to do is match the input from the ampl to the amplifier with the output of the amplifier. So what goes in scales up to the correct amount of output on the other side. A little bit of clipping on the output is not necessarily a bad thing. So when you use that indicator, keep that in mind. So again, a little bit under control, right? This this is all good stuff. And uh, what's the line from that that old movie, Days of Thunder? Rubbing is racing, <laughs> yeah. right? Or clipping is audio. If you never, ever clip, you're never going to be happy with the output. You got to do a little bit, especially on a subwoofer amplifier. But the, the trick is doing it correctly without overdriving things on the massive end. A little bit of clipping at near full volume versus a little bit of clipping at like one tenth of the volume. That's a very different story. A little bit of clipping at the end of your volume limit, you're okay. A little bit of clipping at the beginning of it, every click beyond that is just driving you into the black and that's not good. 
Yeah, and set your receiver level. That's a good point, Steve. Set your receiver level. Um, if you're not sure what the output is of that and how clean the output is of your receiver, 75% is kind of a general rule of thumb um, to go on there. It's not precise by any means, um, but it is a good rule of thumb and a good starting point um, to go on there. You don't want to set your input sensitivity with your volume on 10 if it goes to 50 um, you know, we've all gotten into those cars where the guy turns on the, uh, the audio system and he turns it up to 10 and it's railing, railing loud. And he's like, just think if I turned it to 40, what it would be, <laughs> right? The speakers would be exploding out of the doors. And, <laughs> and I understand where that's coming from. Cause you can see that, that, well, it can only get louder. It always goes up. All things have limits. All things have limits. <laughs> yeah. So make sure that you set that three quarter volume and then um, set up your indicator light and you will be good. And if you have a friend with a, a screwdriver that thinks they can make your system louder, tell them uh, to not touch it right now for you. So <laughs> ask them if they're going to warranty your speakers after you blow them from them being overdriven. <laughs> So filters on there. The other thing that we have to go through and do is set our high pass filter or low pass filter, depending on if we're dealing with a uh, full range amplifier or subwoofer amplifier. Um, this one here, we're particularly working with a subwoofer amplifier. So we're going to turn on our low pass filter. Um, this will keep our subwoofers playing the lower frequencies. So we don't want our subwoofers playing uh, super high um, because it won't mesh very well with your mains. The goal of this is to get your main speakers or your coaxials to mesh well with your subwoofer. So you wanna make sure that you get those two dialed in um, properly. 80 Hertz is a good, again, roll of thumb on there. If you don't have the equipment to go in and measure what's happening into the vehicle or any of that stuff. 80 Hertz is a good roll of thumb on there. If you find yourself going below 70 or above say 110 or hundred Hertz in there, I'll say hundred because uh, I'll play it safe there. Take a measurement or find somebody that's got a measurement system in there and see what's going on um, in the system. So in those ranges are good. 80 Hertz is just your good kind of rule of thumb to, uh, to start off with. And you do have some adjustability in there. Like I said, if you go down to 70 or go up to 90 or hundred on there, you're not, uh, not going to damage anything, but you might start messing with the meshing between your mains or blending, I should say, between your subwoofer and your main speakers. And that goes back to like laying out the system design to, to play everything and not just 20% of the audible spectrum, right? Uh, that goes back to, you know, Kevin's thing about 80% of the sounds coming from your doors. Um, and that's, that's pretty accurate. So when you're setting your low pass filter, the idea is to stop high frequency from going to your subwoofer and let only low frequency do go to the speaker that's designed to handle that. And then all the higher frequencies go to drivers that can handle those frequencies and not ask those speakers to do what the subwoofer is capable of doing. So very often the limiting factor is going to be the main speakers. How low can they play before they just don't have enough uh, ability to to play loud at those lower frequencies and if you find yourself with a very high high pass filter frequency on your main speakers and a very low low pass uh, frequency for your low pass filter on your subwoofers you'll wind up with a dropout in level between the subwoofers and the mains and that can be very off-putting when you're listening to the system so you probably want to make sure that your system design allows your main speakers to try to couple up as close as possible with your subwoofers and you know th this is one of those scenarios where spending like 90 percent of your budget on subwoofers and 10 percent of your budget on everything else is probably not going to yield very balanced and good sound overall yes you may have lots of bass but the main speakers are really going to struggle at that point and look i know bass is fun but when you only have the bass and you don't have the means it just doesn't sound as good and uh, you know it's one of those things that other people that maybe are not just into bass when they get into your vehicle to listen to it it doesn't sound that good to them and they may tell you to turn it down and no one wants to do that i can always make more sound later but getting balanced sound that really needs to come from proper smart system design up front you know some of the things we've already talked about so yeah, and just to add on to what Steve said there, when you do add in that uh, uh, full range amplifier like the JD400-4, we're able to have that high pass filter on there and then you can match them up fairly closely. So you have 80 hertz and your subwoofer is playing from 80 hertz um, all the way down and then your mains will play from 80 hertz all the way up. And again, this isn't 
completely dialed in if you don't have the ability to measure it this is just really good starting points to uh to get you going on there so just keep that in mind but you don't want to have a huge gap in between those two filters because you're going to have a null um, in there and it is going to be noticeable the biggest thing i've noticed um, when we are dealing with a lot of this stuff is that blending between the subs and the mains if it's not right or if it's off you're gonna sit there you're gonna listen to it you're gonna say man something's just not right something's like it's just not right exactly right. right so you're you're gonna notice it and we touched on this a few seconds ago adding in the base uh eq on there so we have the base boost eq it's the uh, optional rbc-1 that you can add in and it is a uh up to 12 uh, db of boost on there to be able to go through and uh and make some adjustments or level control on the amplifiers or on the JD amplifiers itself. So it works out very, very well on there. If you want to add it, try to add that in when they're doing the initial installation, um, but it is not needed. You can add that guy in later if you want to. So. And just to be clear, the RBC one is separate from the base boost that's on the amplifier. So the base boost is a standalone boost. Yeah. RBC one's just level control. Just so when, that thing right. Right. when that's yeah. turned all the way up, yeah. you're at whatever the input sensitivity is of your amplifier and anything down from that, you're just attenuating from the peak output. Yeah. Which is a great feature if you if you listen to a variety of music. Sometimes mm -hmm. you want you know the bass to be all the way up, which is probably most of the time for the audience that we're likely talking to. Uh, but there may be cases where it's just too much if you're listening to something that's a bit more balanced and that the bass is too strong. You can back it down using that RBC from the front of the vehicle. Um, but as Rob pointed out, that bass boost is something you set on the amplifier, and then the RBC is separate from it. Be cautious about using the, the, the bass boost. I know it sounds like a great thing. Oh, cool. Let's boost more bass. But everything does have limits, so make sure you're doing it right. And very often it doesn't um, it doesn't do quite what you think it's going to do. It, it's a, it will rise the level of the bass uh, at certain frequencies more than others. It's like an EQ slider. Um, effectively on the amplifier. So it may or may not be a, a pleasing thing for you, yeah. but that's where tuning and listening comes in really, really handy. Um, so when you're doing your installation, try to gain access to the, the product without modifying the system. What I mean by that is if you have to remove the, st the sub box to get to the amplifier, it's going to be very hard to tune it um, because you can't listen to it while you're tuning it, right? So uh, that's for, part of For those system. that say, why would you ever want to turn down your subwoofers? Listen to one, the album from Metallica, or And Justice for All from Metallica. <laughs> but that whole album, Lars's kick drums are so boosted. If you have subwoofers in your system, you'll be like, ah, it's metal. Who need? That's where an RBC one comes in handy because you can actually listen to the album once you turn the subwoofers down. Right. And that's, that's why these controls and adjustments are available to us. Um, and we typically like them on the fly because um, we're going to dial in an audio system with music that we would typically listen to that we know that sounds pretty good at when we do our listening test. But be mindful that just because I like something, you know, I like to listen to a certain type of music at a certain level. Other people may listen to other music at different levels. So like Rob's saying, if you listen to Metallica and you tune everything based on Metallica, you're probably going to wind up turning down that bass because it's probably going to come through as being too much. It's overbearing. And then you play some bass track that you want more of it. That's where a, a, an RBC can be really handy. You tune it for something that needs a bit more boost, and then you dial it back when it has too much. Yeah. That's a, yeah. That's I approach. listen to a ton of different music. I mean, a ton of different music. And uh, and it definitely, they do help. Um, yeah. You know, whether you're using this or a DRC on, uh, on some of the other amplifiers on the line, they do definitely help be able to balance everything out <clears throat> on there. And that is exactly right. Tune it to where the knob is at, you know, getting to the limit mm -hmm. and then bring the knob down. That way, when you need a little more, you want a little less in there, you have the full adjustment uh, to be able to go through and do that. Uh, I think there was, um, I, I think our next slide is our summary or our. Yeah, we're going to. So, so basically, if you have any questions or anything like that, feel free to contact tech support. You can go in and, uh, and email them at technical at jlaudio.com. We have a web uh, form on there that you can go in and uh, off the website and contact them that way. You can also contact them via phone. Um, three of the best guys in the, uh, the industry. Phone's probably, I see Steve shaking his head, phone's <laughs> probably the least. Uh, well, yeah. a lot of people think the phone is the fast way but it's very often not because, you know, 
know, the, the tech guys might ask you a question. Hey, can you go take this measurement? And you're like trying to manage your phone. And I'll call you back. Well, that, that's slower. If yeah. you fill out the web form or send an email that has all the information, hey, I measured the voltage of this. I checked this and I checked that. The, the tech guys have a better understanding of your system and they can come back at you with a more complete answer faster. So it also allows them to multitask, mind you. But uh, again, phone, you're welcome to call. We love chatting with people, getting good ideas, going back and forth. But when it comes to troubleshooting, if you need a quick answer, fill in a form or send an email that the guys can actually do some research and get back to you with a more complete answer. Yeah, absolutely. And then if you have any uh, questions or anything that you want to talk to uh, any of us uh, here, you can uh, contact us at training at jlaudio.com. We're not uh, as keen as the tech support guys on uh, on tech issues. Um, but if you have uh, something that you want us to do on a, on a Thursday afternoon training or any suggestions, um, feel free to go ahead and email us there. And we can go ahead and get those taken care of for you uh, also. So, so, I Rob, I, I hope you were able to keep up with some of the, the more recent questions that I saw in the chat there. I'd love to be able to. Yeah, I'm, 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 looking, I, <laughs> I'm looking at them right now, too, and I was like, wow. There were some good yeah. ones. So, so yeah. Rob, why don't you start you know, ticking them off for us so we can yeah. start addressing them? So let's start at the top. Uh, Jonathan was asking when we were discussing the 15W0 uh, V3, uh, not looking for SPL hair tricks. I don't know why not. That's always fun when <laughs> hair is flying and paper and stuff. Um, <laughs> however, with a proper amp, how well would the 15 drop in a trunk? Would it be enough to mess with my breathing? Well, there's, it's loud. It's going to have a good amount of output. Um, you know, I, it's, that's a tough question. You know, there's a lot of variables that come into play. How the vehicle, you know, how much deadening, like we talked about to minimize losses, uh, you know, access from the trunk into the cabin. My car, my trunk is very sealed. Um, I actually removed my factory eight inch subwoofer and used a fast ring to decouple the trunk and the cabin of my car. So all the base is forced through that eight inch hole right into the cabin of my vehicle. So there's a lot of variables. Um, you know, we can't tell you if it's going to impact your breathing or not. You know, it's uh, not a, a monster subwoofer on monster amounts of power. It has the potential to move a lot of air. It has the potential to get loud. A few hundred um, watts on a 15W0 is enough to pressurize cabin quite nicely. So yeah. um, if that's what you're looking for, yeah, absolutely you can get that. Um, but again, it's going to be hard for a pair of six and a half in your doors to keep up with some of that energy at times. So just bear that in mind. So I think a single 15 with 500 watts of power or so on it is going to be a pretty rock solid system in almost any application. Please make sure you do the enclosure correctly. Enclosure design um, and integration into your vehicle is, is key. Everything that Rob just said in terms of energy transfer from the trunk of your vehicle um, or the boot of the vehicle into the main part of the, the, the listening area is going to be critical. If you only have enough room for like eight inches or so of energy to come through, it'll be restrained. It'll be restricted in some way. So that's why it's very difficult to give you an absolute answer. I can tell you that this, the system is very, very capable of doing some really cool things. Um, your mileage may vary. Yeah. I would um, uh, definitely put uh, a rubber isolator on your license plate though. On, on uh, license. Yes. Yeah. But inside the car, you may not hear that. So. <laughs> Cares with people outside. Those are bragging rights sometimes that people like the vibration. Oh, listen to that! You know? <laughs> I used anyway. to be that guy. You know what? I had. I, I don't know if it's me getting older. Obviously, yes. this is what we do for a living. <laughs> but when I'm next to a car that's just rattling and booming at the intersection, I just shake my head at times like. <laughs> well, for me, it's Why not the, the loudness of the audio system. It, it's the inability to control all that vibration. Right. It's right. not that hard. I just have to no. go find it and kill it, right? You know? <laughs> so that's what I get frustrated at. It's not that the system's too loud. It's the vibrations are louder. That's annoying. <laughs> <laughs> I had a I had an Audi a long long time ago, and man, I went through that thing and and put matting everywhere, anything that rattled. I went and found it and 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 tried to tried to kill it. Inside the tail light, there was something uh -huh. <laughs> that rattled, and they were some sealed tail lights that you know that were crazy that you couldn't just pop open and figure. Out. My third brake light, same yeah. thing. Oh, and sometimes you not. go nuts trying to fix that stuff. <laughs> <But> fix <it. laughs> 
Uh, what else did we not, get, Rob? I saw some not, more in there. Not necessarily a question, but I like where Mark was going because I was going to say the same thing, but then I was like, ah, Kevin already pushed one. Steve pushed one. I don't need to push one. But the <laughs> well, JD250 yeah. slash one, you know, with a properly designed enclosure and the right subwoofer for a low power application, that 100%. is a fantastic little amplifier. And yeah, you know, we talked about being, you know, uh, you know, high value or budget conscious. You know, if you don't need 500 watts, you don't right. need something as large. That is a heck of an amplifier at a lower price point if needed. If yep. you don't need the 500 watts of power, so it's easy on your wallet, easy on your electrical system, easy to fit in an installation. There's lots of really good stuff about that. And Mark is absolutely dead on. Proper enclosure design can be vital. If you don't do the box right, that ain't going to sound as good as it potentially could. So you know, pay attention to all that stuff, and you'll be rewarded with the results. So Jonathan also had another good question since we were talking Jonathan's about impedance on earlier on. He says he's heard that four ohm load or a forum impedance guarantees the higher quality sound in the bass, while two ohm is more for higher output. Is that true? Guarantees is a tough, uh, tough yeah. word. <laughs> Tricky word. So I, I can see where this might have originated. Um, in general, to, speaking in very general terms, a, a lower impedance load on a given amplifier in general is going to is going to allow that amplifier to put out. Um, possibly more power and that more power could in fact result in higher amounts of decibel, you know, dBSPL. That is potentially where the higher dB from a lower impedance subwoofer may have come from. That is not always the case just for the record, but in most cases that may be true for most applications, right? Mm -hmm. So then on the opposite side of that, the four ohm would then not push the amplifier as hard in those cases and therefore maybe could sound better. But the reality is if we take if we take a lot of this stuff and we, we go to a higher level view of it, the, the impedance of the coil you know, of the, the voice coil of a subwoofer is not really, uh, assuming proper design, is not really the determinant of quality. It's simply part of the motor, simply, <laughs> it is part of the motor system of the speaker to make sure that the performance is going to be there. Um, I can only really speak of the way JL Audio has designed subwoofers traditionally throughout the years, where we'll design the four ohm, like as an example, a four ohm version of the woofer and optimize that design. And then we'll go back and we'll try to maybe, you know, for example, do a two ohm version of that woofer and see if we could get comparable performances. Um, from both of those different types of, uh, you know, they're, they're two distinct subwoofers. They may both be 12 inch subwoofers or 10 subwoofers, but they actually have a different set of parameters because they are inherently different because the coil is different. And in some cases, it drives the tech guys nuts because the four ohm version will have one recommendation and the two ohm version might have a different recommendation. <laughs> I share this message like that. we develop it differently. It's not just, okay, here's a two ohm coil. We'll use that one and sell it that way. It, it is a new design of speaker at that point. So Jonathan, it may be true in some applications, but um, it shouldn't be. It really shouldn't be. The, the speaker itself should be designed in such a way that regardless of what the impedance of the coil is, as long as the amplifier is not stressed out, the, the quality of it should be whatever it should be. So if it's a really high quality subwoofer and it happens to be two ohms, three ohms, four ohms, eight ohms, th the number of ohms is not the determinant of quality. It's design of the woofer. What may determine quality is if the amplifier is stressed beyond belief. So if yeah. the amplifier is misbehaving, then you will compromise the performance of the speaker. Yeah. So hopefully that is kind of good. And to add to that, in in going back in 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 the day of car, <laughs> back in my day, how far back are we going, Kevin? <laughs> I was trying to like make himself. <laughs> <laughs> I just graduated high school last year. I don't know what you guys are talking about. Anyway, um, back in the day, amplifiers would generally, you know, subwoofer amplifiers would generally run at very very low impedances to generate more power, right? I mean, you'd have quarter ohm amplifiers for for going out and doing uh, competition and stuff like that. And in some of those cases, like the, the damping factor and all of that would kind of lower down a little bit when you would get into those. Going from a four ohm to two ohm, you're, you're, yeah. you're so close to there. But if you're going from like a four ohm down to an old, old amplifier that was a quarter ohm, quarter whatever, ohm. then you yeah. might <laughs> might be able to. But again, if, if the amplifier is competent at those levels without yeah. getting into misbehavior, right. um, you should you should really be fine. But it's really right. about optimization. Yep. That's what it comes down to. 
So when we were talking about uh, setting our input sensitivity, uh, Sacktown Steve was asking, does using 75% uh, volume on your source unit for input sense for input sensitivity adjustment assume one's going to listen to it at 100% volume? So I love this one. Excellent question, That's Steve. Question. Um, Very it's a great name too, by the way. Um, <laughs> so the reason why we tend to recommend 75%, there's several different things, and I just want to hit on some of the highlights. Most source units are not going to be clipping when they're at 75%, and we want to make sure we stay away from clipping the signal that's being used to calibrate the system. The clipping behavior can give you some misinformation when you're doing all, all the other adjustments downstream. So you want to stay away from that. And the reality is most listeners are going to be listening either at three quarter or maybe even higher. And that's kind of going back to where I say that, you know, clipping is part of the audio system, right? But you want to control it. So if you set everything up to not be misbehaving at three quarter volume and you wind up going that last little bit up to 100 percent, which you probably will, you will be clipping a little bit. And that's OK. What you don't want to do is set everything up at 25% and then have 75% of your volume control to get yourself into trouble. And I think someone followed up with that saying that most music, most you know, uh, information that you're going to be listening to doesn't take advantage of the full range of the voltage capability of anything. It's usually going to be somewhat below that. This is not always true. There is some music that gets a lot closer to that than you might be expecting. But his point is a valid one that even you know, non-dynamic music is not going to be a full square wave all the time, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a variation in the music signal itself. So what happens there is as the music is varying, it, it doesn't get um, clipped off. It doesn't get into misbehavior as you're overdriving the input stage or the output stage of the amplifier. So 75% gives a little bit of buffer to allow for the dynamics in music or lack of dynamics in music without compromising too much of the audibility of the system. If you listen to... Uh, You've probably never heard of this <laughs> this particular recording, but there's a recording um, by a group called Flim and the BBs, and it's a jazz recording it's called Tricycle. They make a number of them. And it was recently um, kind of spread around the, the audiophile circles um, just in the past couple of weeks. And the dynamic range on this is enormous. And at full volume on some systems, if not done correctly, you can barely hear it. It's just not enough. You want more, but you're out. You, you just don't have any more range left. And then all of a sudden there's this crescendo and tons of information that it, it's as loud as you could ever want it to be, but it's over a very short duration. And again, most people aren't listening to that type of music. So you want to make sure that with the kind of music you're listening to, you're still getting a lot of level without overdriving things. 75% works really, really well for that. Again, your mileage may vary, but 75% does allow to go to 100% without undue risk of damage. Not zero risk, but uh, without undue risk. It's like, you know, so just be careful. So. Uh, good question here from Bob. How do I get my JD 400 slash four to be a hundred Watts at two ohms bridge front, then back door speakers. Well, it doesn't quite work like that. Uh, really the way the amplifiers are going to work in terms of what your output is really comes down to the speaker's resistance. So a traditional, you know, four ohm speaker is going to be seen as, you know, roughly cause you know, it changes with power, but it'll be seen as a four ohm load. So it'll, you'll get the power. So if we want to get two ohms, you either need to get a two ohm driver or multiple drivers properly wired to get to the final uh, uh, impedance that we need to be. So if we wanted the full 100 watts out of a channel of your JD 400 slash four, you would either need, you know, two pairs of four ohm speakers wired to two ohms or have a dedicated two ohm driver for that. But bridging it does not change the impedance. We're just uh, essentially, you know, merging our channels for more output power. And if I remember correctly, I think we require a four ohm load uh, for that anyways. When we for bridge a bridge pair, engines. yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah. So and, um, it really comes down to your drivers themselves and not how you have the amplifier configured, but the driver or drivers and how they're wired. Right. And that's about, you know, system optimization, some of the things we touched on earlier. Um, you know, Bob's question is a really good one because there is a lot of confusion over how to get the most performance out of a given amplifier. And like Rob is just saying, there's there's several different ways. Some of them are more practical than others. Um, so trying to get uh, main speakers to be a two ohm load to get that higher power rating out of the amplifier can be challenging because there's not that many speakers that are actually rated at two ohms as an individual speaker for, for door speakers, that is. Right. And doubling up it's not very easy to do. So that can be a bit of a challenge. Um, so just bear in mind that most door speakers 
regardless of quality, regardless of manufacturers, they're going to be optimized to run between 25 and 75 to 100 watts per speaker. So, so long as you're in that range, you're probably good. And you know, once you learn uh, a lot about the you know the three dB rule, if you go from 75 watts to 100 watts, you're not going to have significant improvement in terms of overall output. It's there, but it's not like earth shattering. So I wouldn't worry too too much about those main speakers. When it gets into the subwoofers, that's when I start playing the impedance game. And Rob made a statement earlier, and I, I think he used the wrong word. I, I know it was accidental. Um, yeah. When you're looking at the impedance, like a 4 ohm or a 2 ohm, it doesn't change with power, it changes with frequency. It's just easier to talk about um, a single number, like a, a 4 ohm nominal impedance driver. That means that the, it's not technically correct, but the average of the, the, of the, the impedance of the resistance is going to be around 4 ohms. And that's not even correct in and of itself. But uh, what Rob was saying is that as the frequency changes, you'll have this change in the resistance that's shown to the amplifier. So we use a, a nominal impedance, like a 4 ohm or a 2 ohm or a 3 ohm, whatever it may be. So um, again, that gets a little heady and gets a little weird, but just minor correction there. So. All right. Another question come in. Can I add another 12W3V3 to my 1,000 watt monoblock? Sure, you can do whatever your heart desires. <laughs> <laughs> you may only do it once, right? <laughs> now, there are some things you want to make sure. Obviously, uh, you know, make sure you have room in the trunk and all of that. But, you know, um, I'm always a fan. As long as the final resistance is in line, the impedance is in line with what the amplifier is able to handle, as Steve was, you know, talking about earlier, as long as the amp doesn't misbehave, you should be fine. Now, of course, obviously, if you're adding an amp to it, that means less power to the drivers, but that's not a bad thing because we're still going to get more output by doubling our uh, piston area by adding that second driver. But it also is going to, for me, the reliability factor, less power to a driver means less heat. It's not going to have to move as much. Even when you're pushing it to the limits, it's not pushing the driver to the limits now because that power is being shared evenly amongst the drivers. So you can definitely do it. Um, I think it improves reliability in the system when you go that route. And, uh, you know, I'm, we're, you know, no replacement for displacement. I've always said, if you want to get louder, you need to add more speakers, not more power. And, you know, so well, you can technically do it both ways. Now, yes. you know, uh, there was time when I was a younger man <laughs> where JL Audio really only sold subwoofers. So of course, then it was like, just buy more speakers. Right. <laughs> but then we started doing amplifiers. And the reality is this. There's several different ways to improve your overall output. You know, Rob is you know, use the old adage: there ain't no replacement for displacement. What he means is bigger pistons that move further is a good way to get loud, but you do need to drive them, so you need right. some power. And back in the day, we used to use several different woofers with a good amount of power, and things were good. We didn't overdrive things. We used speakers and power fairly judiciously to make a nice balanced subwoofer system with lots of reliability. Then we started getting crazy. We had single speakers that could handle lots of power. And we had lots of power that suddenly became far more affordable than ever before. So we said, well, why use lots of speakers when I could use one big speaker and one really big amplifier? And warranty was really high because people were overdriving things. Well, it says it can handle it. Yeah, it can, but let's be normal about this. I'd rather, as Rob kind of alluded to i'd rather instead of i'm just going to use crazy numbers a, a speaker that's rated at a thousand watts instead of putting a thousand watts on one speaker and try to drive it to its limits instead get two of those speakers and use the same amplifier get half the power and still be louder yeah. that's a more efficient way and a, more of a balance now of course everything has limits so i'm going to spend a, another minute on a soapbox maybe a minute and a half but mm -hmm. when it comes to getting high performance like this and from a subwoofer system in a car there's a couple of things that really come into play one is physical space in any given application you will eventually run out of physical space to put more and more speakers or subwoofers or whatever the case may be the enclosures that go with them the energy transfer from wherever they're mounted to the listening area there will, there will be some kind of a limit Similarly, there's a limit to how much electrical power you can get out of an installation. There's only so much electrical energy in a vehicle that you can actually use. Finding a good balance of how many speakers we can get in there and how much power we can get in there to get the maximum output without compromising the subwoofers or compromising performance, that's where the magic of system design comes in. This message brought to you by your local JL Audio dealer. Okay. <laughs> so there, off the soapbox, sorry. <laughs> 
All right. Uh, so to simplify question. that, make sure that the <laughs> amplifier can handle the load that you're mm -hmm. going to put on it with those uh, with that second driver. If it can't, then you may need to purchase um, a different impedance uh, drivers to, to go on with that. Power handling wise, yes, it can handle it without any problems, but you need to make sure that your uh, amplifier can handle the load. Right. Uh, great question from Ryan. Should a car subwoofer be level matched with a DB meter, similar to how it's done with a home theater system? It's an awesome question. That is a good question. <laughs> so the short answer is, yeah. <laughs> in a way, yeah. So um, what he's referring to, I believe what he's referring to is when we dial in home audio systems, very often they, they play um, uh, a series of tones or, or you know, barks of uh, pink noise or whatever from each one of the channels. And it'll automatically, uh, it'll, a lot of the, the home receivers will have a routine that will go through and make sure the levels are all set correctly. Um, there are some attempts at this to be done in, in mobile audio where it does similar things where you can try to get everything to be level matched uh, correctly in a, in a vehicle. Uh, and some of them work well, some of them don't work so well. Um, so what I share with you, Ryan, is to, to understand what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is make sure that the whole system is well balanced. Um, and I saw another one of the, the, the comments there that I'll try to address with this answer as well. Um, when you're dialing in your system, you do ultimately want at some point the whole system to, do, to be well balanced. Now, it doesn't mean flat because flat may not be what we're looking for. What we typically would want is a slight uh, elevation in low frequency. There's low frequency from their view, right? <laughs> so the, the, the low frequencies tend to, to want to be a little bit higher. There's lots of reasons for this, but suffice to say that we tend to like a bit of a rise in the low frequency. So what I would do is I would tune my system so that at the most common listening level, roughly 75%, that the bass is very well dialed in. Not maximum, but well dialed in. So that if you wanted to increase it a little bit more, you could do that. If you wanted to back it down a little bit, you could do that as well using like an RBC or something like that. So that kind of answers a, another question that I saw in the chat. Um, but to, to Ryan's specific question, yes, the goal is to get it to, to be uh, balanced. Not necessarily exactly the same as the main speakers, but to blend together well with those main speakers. Hopefully that answers the question, Ryan. So it's a good one. I like that. <laughs> Car sounds over the Netherlands says you can balance the system with that nice yellow JD lookalike. <laughs> He's talking about the Max. But yeah, you know, if you've watched our um, our previous sessions, we've been doing a lot about system tuning and tune point four and Max and target curves. And if you look at the target curve we use, it's it's the same thing. We're using a curve essentially to level match. Uh, initial level match before you get in and listen, obviously. And of course, it's going to be catered to the listener's preferences, you know, and what the dominant music may be. Um, but it's the same thing. When you look at our target curves we've been talking about for Tune 4 and using Tune 4, uh, Max, or just system tuning in general, there, there's a, 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 the curve has a shape for a reason to keep everything in balance. So um, whether you're system tuning a DSP or just doing a standard analog system, uh, you know, you have to have that balance that we were talking about. Just like earlier, you know, you don't want 2,000 watts of bass probably on a 4 by 50 amplifier. It's just not, you know, it's going to be too much and make everything else overwhelmed. So it's a combination of proper install and setup. But also, for me, it starts at system design, picking yeah. the right components to make sure there's not going to be these gross, very, you know, differences in level potential between subwoofers and the coaxial or, you know, component speakers in the vehicle. Yeah, and we did actually some pretty good math on this. And I say we when I mean Steve. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but he did a great job. Excel is a uh, master at it. But um, did, did a nice little spreadsheet and took a look at a bunch of different systems and in the, in the budgeting of each one. And it's interesting. It kind of comes out to be like a 60-40 split. You're going to end up 60% of your budget being on the subwoofer subwoofer amplifier and supporting um enclosure uh, wire all that stuff right yeah so your enclosure wire all of that stuff and then 40 percent of your uh budget would be used for your mains up in the front uh, and that would include ring. like the the foam rings and the damping material and all that other stuff we mm -hmm. talked about that works out really well especially when you're doing cost conscious or high value system design like a focus of today's conversation we did kind of talk about how that breaks down when you start getting insane with things um but th at that point it's not about allocation of budget it's about hitting the goals of the system more so it's uh, you know absolutely true so. 
follow-up question from Sacktown Steve. The max head unit volume he uses is at 70%. So can I set my input sensitivity at a lower volume? That way I can get more base output at lower volumes. It gets tricky. We, we can play the game um, a little bit that way. And kind of if you if you set everything up at a lower volume, what you're doing is you're, you're trying to get the maximum output of the amplifier with less voltage to the input. That's the input sensitivity thing. So if you lower the voltage to the input and you still have it to the maximum, now as you go up higher, you're driving things further into the clipping behavior. Yes, it gets louder at those lower levels because you've got that, you know, the essentially, you know, what would be considered the maximum clean output of the amp at that lower level. But you do run into the issue of now you, you have more clipping at the high end of the level. And I also saw another comment that 75% wouldn't be recommended that it should be higher than that. But the compromise you have there is maybe it's not loud enough at that point. Um, the truth is a subwoofer is probably designed to handle more of that aggressive listening than the main speakers, mm -hmm. right? So if if you're doing a multi-channel audio system where you have dedicated amplifier channel for your mid-bass, mid-range, and tweeter, there are, I mean, you could go ahead and use this 75% method, but when you balance the system, you'll find that you'll be pulling a lot of energy away from the tweeter, getting away from that maximum output potential of the, of, of the system. You know, if you've got a proper system design, and Rob mentioned it really well a moment ago, proper system design, proper installation, those are the first two steps of system tuning. Doesn't seem like it, but it but it really is true. So if you've got a four and eight ohm tweeter and a dedicated amplifier channel of 75 watts to that tweeter, that's a lot of output from that tiny little thing. You don't need that much power. So even if you set it using the 75% of, of the volume control, and you set it to the maximum clean output of the amplifier at 75% of the volume control, when you go to tune it, you'll be pulling power away from those tweeters, getting them away from clipping and not running into the problem. So to, uh, to Steve's question here, I, I would be more cautious about doing that on the main speakers than I would on the subwoofer. Just know that everything has a limit. And if, you, if you're clipping more and more often, you are sending more power over time to the coils on your speakers. And that's what's really gonna hurt a subwoofer. Clipping can cause more problems on a tweeter, and that may have been what uh, Augusto was talking about with his comment earlier. Um, clipping can kill a tweeter, but clipping is not, you know, by itself, the clipping nature of, the, of an amplifier is not really going to hurt a subwoofer. It's the constant clipping over time, that, that increase of average energy over time that adds heat and, you know, can ultimately lead to failures. So, Steve, yes, if you're talking about the subwoofer, you can do the trick of less voltage into the amplifier to a certain level on the output of the amplifier and get away with that uh, a lot easier than you can on main speakers. So, two birds with one stone there, right? Yeah, like we said, the 75% is a good rule of thumb, and it, it's not going to work for every application, um, but it is a good rule of thumb. Um, you need to also make sure you listen to your system, too, and if you hear things struggling, then you may need to turn things down. Just keep that in mind, too. Don't keep uh, keep going if you're hearing clicking going on <laughs> or anything like that. Follow-up question from Bob about uh, the impedance question we were talking about, how to get his amp at 2 ohms. Um, in a passive network, does the tweeter uh, change the impedance of the 6.5-inch driver? So uh, very often a passive network is going to have some type of level attenuation. So... Um, the impedance of the tweeter really doesn't change, but the impedance that the amplifier sees may be a little bit different. That, that whole equation gets a little bit squirrely, uh, technical term there, sorry. Uh, it gets a little weird. <laughs> um, so through a passive network, what's happening there is a, a, a little bit of that level matching. Tweeters tend to be very, very efficient at converting electrical energy into sound output. And it's a uh, and since there's so much power, if let's just say for argument's sake that you split the power evenly between, let's say, a six and a half and a tweeter, the tweeter will be louder, right? It just because it's really, really efficient. In almost every case, it's going to be louder. So we tend to pad that down to the passive network. So now the, the distribution of power is more in favor of the larger driver, which although it's bigger and has more displacement capability, as a speaker design, it tends to be less efficient as well. It's just this weird relationship. So in that case, what we're looking to do is make sure the tweeter and the, and the mid-range or mid-base driver um, balance nicely. And almost always you'll see attenuation on the tweeter. So the short answer is yes, it does change the ohms, um, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. And don't worry about the load on the amplifier because, again, the amount of power that's actually being distributed is less important than the balance between them all. As long as it's loud enough for you, right? If, if it's not loud enough for you, a bigger amplifier can take that whole ratio and push it up higher. 
But again, you might run into trouble of failures, which we don't want, or doubling up, like Rob was saying, if that's physically possible. Does does that does that help for Bob's question, guys? Or did I, I miss it? I think, think so. so. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, Glenn asked, "What microphones are y'all <laughs> using during these trainings?" <laughs> uh, sure, sure. MV88 plus. Nice little kit. Comes with the tripod. Holds your phone <laughs> if you need to do that. And uh, the mic you can either plug into your computer or your phone. So very nice little mics that are uh, not grab, not too expensive. <laughs> Brought to you by. <laughs> Do I get a cut of any sales now? By. Sure. <laughs> um, Stacktown, uh, following up on that, just says that not sure he's ever heard clipping. Is Good. it audible just like it sounds? <laughs> cutting out? Oh, excellent question, Mike. That is a very, very we're good question. Clipping, we're talking about yeah. the signal being clipped. But really what you end up with is just a very muddy, yeah, distorted, gross sound. Like, if it goes away when you turn the volume down, that's probably clipping. So, because yeah. um, I've seen this before, and it, it's one of those things that I never really considered that. But what clipping is referring to, imagine if you had a sine wave that goes up and down. It's nice and curved at the top, nice mm -hmm. and curved at the bottom, right? What clipping is referring to is when the amplifier can no longer replicate that waveform cleanly. So what happens is instead of going up and getting rounded at the top, it goes up and just kind of slides across the rail effectively. So it becomes flat at the top as if you clipped off the top part of the waveform, the, the curved part of the waveform is being clipped off, which is where we get the term clipping. It's not necessarily the system cutting out. It's that the amplifier is running out of power to accurately reproduce a clean sine wave. Uh, so it happens with music too, but it's a lot easier to visualize with a sine wave because we've seen that curvy nature of a sine wave. Imagine if instead of going up and curving, if it just went up and then straight across and then down again. That behavior, it's no longer, you know, imagine um, that your speaker is intended to, to do the same thing as that sine wave, right? So when the signal is going out, or up, your speaker is going out. Then it crests and then it comes back down and it goes inward and then it crests down there and it comes back up. So if it was tracking the sine wave cleanly, that's what would happen with your speaker. If, however, the amplifier is going, you know, the signal from the amplifier is going up and can no longer replicate the sine wave, it's going to send signal that doesn't crest anymore. It just goes flat and your sub is now being pushed out and it stays out for a period of time. It's no longer reproducing the waveform as it was intended because the amplifier can't. The amplifiers run out of power. It has clipped off like a rounded part in it. But Oh, yeah. like, yeah, the in out, the woofer will kind of oh, you telling me to stop. <laughs> oh, no, no, I was trying to mimic what the woofer kind of. Right, right. So the woofer kind of stops moving. You're not going to see this, but you will hear it as kind of a, a raspy sound uh, if it gets severe enough. Again, the amount of clipping necessary for you to hear it in a subwoofer <laughs> needs to be pretty significant. So if you're hearing it in a sub, yeah, you got a problem. On a mid-range driver, it's far more audible. On a tweeter, it's definitely audible. And be very careful there because they're more sensitive to it as well. And, and the other thing is with that is, you know, you mentioned that it goes out and stays out for, for that split second or, or tenth of a second. Well, it's producing heat doing so. And that's the thing with clipping yeah. is when you are doing that, you are generating a lot more heat because that subwoofer is working a lot harder. It's staying out there. It's the, the energy from the amplifier is going to that subwoofer and it is putting power to it, which Increasing is generating heat over average heat. time. And, and what I'll add is that earlier in the session, Kevin was talking about some of the cooling technologies that we build into the speaker. All of them are dependent upon the speaker actually moving. Yeah. So if the speaker's not moving and heat is being poured into to it those cooling circuits aren't doing anything for you that's where failures come in you know i've often kidded around that our engineers are hell-bent on making sure that a warranty department goes out of business you guys are proving that that's never going to happen <laughs> so, we'll try our best to make it very difficult for speakers to fail under normal use it's when things get extreme that the, that they all start to see failures again extreme clipping at that, that behavior of the speaker staying in, in a given state for an extended period of time or repeatedly over an extended period of time will lead to failures regardless of any engineering secrets we may put in to the speaker to try to prevent that yeah. the school of sound song that we do that has the the clipping in it what is it like 6 12 and 24 or something like that it's we do uh the, the tracks uh, what kevin's referring to is we do a training presentation um called the school of sound that it kind of steps through a lot of the different various uh aspects of um the basics of sound and we do talk about this clipping behavior uh, and things like that but there's um we play 
we play a song and then we clip it by three and then 60 B, but the song yeah, is yeah, already song pretty, pretty harsh. Um, yeah. it's a great song. It's Godsmack. Awesome. Um, <laughs> but it, it, the recording itself is already fairly dense in terms of information. So the clipping it, it's, it's audible for sure when you do the 3 dB, but by the time you get to only 6 dB with the clipping, it's really, really bad. But the same amount of clipping, we do the other tracks too. We do um, yeah, there's there's a like jazz, that. like a jazz song. There was right. that jazz one, yeah, that jazz it's been one. a few years. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, a, there's a jazz the song that we clip by uh, 12 dB, that's and it's barely one. audible. Yeah, And that's because... Um, you know, this is going way off the rails. By the way, if you don't want to watch anymore, we're way over time here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we totally understand. We won't be a Q and A today. <laughs> right, it's good Q and A. And you know, to to Sacktown Steve's uh, comment here, clipping itself depends on the music. It depends on a lot of different things, the frequency and how often it's clipping. Blah blah blah. So the the track that we couldn't remember, that guys reminded me, is a jazz track that's very very dynamic. And what that means is that uh, for this the point of this conversation. The peaks in the music, like um, think of like a, a cymbal, you know, hit or like a snap that there's a sudden burst of energy, but it's not very long in duration. Well, this jazz recording has lots of spikes, little short duration events that happen that are really, really high, but most of the energy is very, very low. So when you listen to it on average, it doesn't sound loud, but there's points that are really, really loud. If you clip, you're only going to clip the top of those really short duration parts. So you're not going to hear that very often. It's not. I mean, you can if you're really critical, but it's not as obvious as if most of the music is near the top and then you clip it. Now, most of the time, you'll hear misbehavior, and that becomes far more audible. So you probably have heard clipping, but just didn't know. <laughs> so uh, Rob was kind of saying that if you lower the level and there's still misbehavior, that may not be clipping. Right, so good question. Sounds like we may need to do a school of sound one day. Right. Yeah, I have to, I mean, it's been a while since we've done it. It has been a while. And you know, one of the concerns we always have with that session is uh, you know, what I call the music part when we start talking about mm -hmm. the music. Um, very often people misunderstand what we're trying to say. We're not trying to crab on the music industry or, or the recording industry. We're just trying to educate people that music is part of the equation. Yes. And different types of music, different you know, types of recordings and things of that nature will affect the reliability and overall performance of an audio system. So you can't remove the music from the equation. And that was really the point of that part. So. Yeah, it's, it is interesting. If you think, like Steve mentioned the Godsmack song, if you look at how that song's mastered, it at, at just the way the song is by itself, it's at near clipping levels in a lot of properly set Most up systems. Time, <laughs> so, you know, if, if you're cut, you know, so you got to factor that in. Do you set up or do you maybe goose down the amplifier just a smidge knowing this is already bordering at clipping compared to someone maybe that's listening to jazz, like Steve talked about, where a lot of that average energy is well below the peaks. So that's when we talk about music is a factor, it does come into play. Because if you're, you know, a retailer setting up an amplifier for a uh, someone that listens to more aggressive type music, EDM, certain types of, you know, popular metal or rock, a lot of that stuff's boosted up. Now they are getting better about it the last couple of years. <laughs> But a lot of it's boosted to a level where you could very easily clip it if you don't set your levels properly. So, you know, you might want to be a little more, uh, you know, sensitive, if you will, in that type of system than for someone that's only listening to jazz or music where a lot of the average energy is going to be well below the peak. So, so that um, that reminds me, Rob, an excellent explanation on all that, that um, there's a couple of tracks that I remember doing in the School of Sound that always – Every time I do it, I think of myself, wow, that's really important information. I hope they get it. Uh, one of it was when we played like, a, I think it's like bass mechanic or whatever it is. It's it's one of those classic bass tracks with lots and lots of bass. And it's got the stuff in the mids and highs, right? Well, when you listen to it and you ignore the subwoofer, it doesn't sound bad at all. It doesn't sound like it's screwed yeah. up at all. Because all of the energy is sh shifted down to the, to the lower frequency, and that's where the problem will show up. When you start clipping, it's going to be in the bass region, which it's a lot harder to hear clipping in the bass region. So the mids and highs, they're just cruising along. they got no problem at all, even if it's clipped really badly because the mm -hmm. clipping's happening at the lower frequencies. Then we change and we go over to that Godsmack track. And again, the clipping happens, the same amount of clipping, but now it's spread out over the mid-range area. There's lots of guitar and vocals and stuff in that main part that are all pushed really close to the limits. And when you clip that, it's far more audible. It sounds worse. 
So the type of music does have a factor. You know, Rob mentioned EDM. EDM is very bass heavy and there's not that much happening everywhere else. So that one, the low frequency would, would suffer if you wanted to look at it that way. And then if you took the same system and played something else like a jazz or something that had more maybe energy in the, the mid range, it would, it would be a different set of uh, conditions for the clipping. So. Nightmare on Bay Street. <laughs> I was gonna say, if you guys see me laughing, it's because I'm looking at the comments. I figured it was. Ice, ice baby. Jeff is dating himself. That's for sure. Ice, ice baby. Yeah, he He's a Miami he, boy, by the way. Yeah, he knows his old school hip hop. Him yeah, and I does. listen to he a does. lot of the same <laughs> stuff. <laughs> so there's um there's a recording that was from that time frame, roughly. Um, Tech Master Peb. And I remember hating this because it was so powerful and destructive that people got really carried away with it. They never realized how much energy we could put into a subwoofer. But I'll tell you, those original recordings, if you can find them, they were actually recorded really well. There was nothing wrong with the recording. It was just really powerful in the subregion. Um, and you know, if you can find it today, I mean, it, it may not be as cool or as fun as, as it was back then because times have changed. But if you want a bass recording that's actually recorded really well, none of this like you know crazy over compressed stuff or anything like that, Techmaster PEB, that original one, that was awesome. Uh, it was awesome stuff. It was fun. So yeah, it was interesting well, doing school of sound and uh, and going through that stuff and learning. Um, and really putting a lot of effort into how music is recorded and how it's mastered and how some tracks are, are mastered separately. And sometimes they just master the whole album, you know, right. together. And, and then when they do the whole album, certain songs may be a little higher level right. or a little lower level. And it's, it's, a, it's a crap shoot. It's, it's not good. It's not bad. It's just the way it is. The way it is. The way and that's, that's the, the concern I always have with school of sound is I don't want people to think that it's doom and gloom. There you go. I'm all in. <laughs> you gotta look for it. it was recently remastered. He says. Wow, that's gotta be awesome because it was already mastered really well. <laughs> Hopefully, they didn't screw it up. <laughs> a lot of the remasters nowadays are not as good as the originals because they. Yeah. Well, I've noticed a lot of that. For me, I tried to always listen to original context. I found it to be more dynamic and less muddled than the remaster because they're trying to typically make it sound a little louder and a little more fun than what right. the original recordings were. So. Yeah. So. I, I, School sounds a lot of fun. It's a very long presentation when we get a chance to do the, the full on thing, um, which I do recommend if we ever have an opportunity to give us the time to let it to, to kind of develop. It does go through the fundamentals of audio to get a better understanding of how to set up and, and you know to design, install, and set up systems properly for performance and reliability. And a lot of what we talked about today in terms of you know high value audio system design is really from the foundations of, of, mm -hmm. of that. And it's look, we didn't invent anything in the school of sound other than some maybe some cool math for some quick calculations and things of that. And you know that's just you know, logical stuff. Um, but the the principles as part of the school of sound are sound as uh, sound today as they were you know 20 odd years ago when we first created the, the the course i will tell you that the original course was an eight hour presentation i sat through it yep. and i'll wait while people get themselves off the floor <laughs> yes people actually dedicated eight hours of their day to listen to yours truly ramble on about audio and i i gotta tell you that you know this 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 these presentations that we do, we put a lot into it in terms of our own mind share and stuff. But when, when we're in front of an audience and in front of an audience like this, there's a lot of energy that goes into it. And uh, as a friend of mine that used to work together with me and doing these trainings back in the earliest days, Jason saying, you know, him and I would do these trainings together because it's way too much for one person to do. And we'd bounce off of each other. And at the end of the day, we wanted to, you know, take the guys out and go, you know, celebrate the, the you know, the, the course being over and uh, being together. And we were so tired at the end of the day. We just wanted to go to bed. <laughs> but um, I think the documentation, I think it lives on our help center. You know, yeah, the there is on the help center um, under the School of Sound section, under mm -hmm. audio. Um, there's a, You can download the document. It's a PDF. And I think we still have the YouTube video of you and Jason doing it back in 2011. Yeah, it was a long time ago. <laughs> Why is we did that people to know, up. like, because you're going to look a little different. Your hair's darker there, and so. <laughs> yes, I do look different, but yeah, that was that was a lot of fun. I like doing that session. Um, it's rare that we get the kind of time to let that unfold. Um, yeah. So yeah, Sean Sean's mentioning that he was on there as well. Um, I, I do remember all that. That was fun. 
I don't think the one that's on the video is the eight hour one. I think it's no, it was four hours. It was one. four yeah. hours, and and you could tell because yeah. I'm in full Steve mode. Which for and, those that don't know, further in years <laughs> years that have followed, I mean, we've condensed into where we now do it in three hours. Yeah, two and a half, three. But yeah. it's not the same. It's, you know, it's not. not. Yeah, when, when, we, I went when we do it, the full yeah. version, you know, we we unfold and we have the audience participation where they mm -hmm. actually start doing math for you know, Ohm's Law series and, and parallel wiring. And, of course, when we do the short version, we simply state it, we run it on the board, and we move on because we don't have time, right? Mm -hmm. Um but in the full version, we have we'll have people come up and do it. They'll use a calculator to give you an idea how long ago we did this. We had to provide calculators because not everybody had one. Not everybody had one, right? <laughs> you know, now everybody has one. <laughs> but back when we first started, not everybody had one, so we had to provide them. Um, I had to use my watch. Yeah, calculator. <laughs> right? You were a high tech guy, right? <laughs> yeah, but that that's a good session. Definitely, if if you want to learn a lot about that stuff, you know, uh, grab the document. Some of the references in terms of our product and things like that are a bit dated, but just replace it with the new stuff. It, it, it you know, it's the best part about it is it's just science, right? It's not brand science specific. Physics. There's some obvious JL stuff in there, but it's all about the science of sound, which is an alternate name for it. Um, but it, it's fun and it's very, I think, very educational. And I'd love to be able to do that again. Just, I want to yeah. be able to do it right. So, an in person, awesome. that's kind of an in person. You got to be, yeah, well, yeah, you know, music think, demos and music demo. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of demos. Yeah. And it's, uh, yeah, it's fun. I mean, you could listen to the speakers, but it's just not the same. <laughs> oh, Sean remembers the props, it's like Carrot Top. <laughs> So yeah, Wait, when, there's more. <laughs> there's always more, right? <laughs> when I did it, I would have tables worth of stuff, right? You yeah. know? I'd grab something from over here, grab something from over there. It, you know, it's fun. A lot of fun. One day. Woo, we are at an hour and 45 minutes, gents. Yeah, we're in triple time. overtime. <laughs> Wait, you got to put Jeff's comment up. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I... Okay, boss said so. I didn't want to like over push ourselves, but Jeff does say that the original school of sound should be an installer 101 training requirement. Thank and at you. least read the book, right? <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Um, I do remember you being, you know, part of some of those sessions in those early days too. So it's nice to to see people, you know, that uh, appreciate what went into that. I'll take full credit for writing it, even though I didn't. <laughs> Manville oh, actually put them together with some input from uh, you know our engineers and some of the the trainers as well. Um, but it's a great, great, great class. So, and, and it's if you're with what's video, an electron, yeah, <laughs> no. yeah. um, we got a question about where to find the video. At, I so am actually. I was going to ask if you're looking for. It. I'm on it. <laughs> So I'm going to post in the chat right now the link to the Help Center article that has the video embedded as well as the document for download. Excellent. Cool. Oh, cool. Somebody got you already. Somebody beat you, Rob. I'm just saying. Slow yeah. on the draw. <laughs> awesome. Well, I'm going to head home. So yeah. uh, thank, you, thank you, everyone, for, for watching. I know we went long, but the questions were really, really good. You got us remembering some fun stuff. Um, obviously, lots of ideas for future opportunities for training. Um, another request for Jail Audio After Dark. Well, it's getting dark already, so I guess we're getting closer to that, right? Dark, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, keep watching the space. We have more trainings coming up, and um, we definitely appreciate any feedback you may be able to drive us in terms of uh, content requests, uh, maybe a different you know time or date. You know, the jail after dark. We're we're gonna we're gonna find a way to make that happen, guys. Somehow, I don't know how, but we're gonna find a way to make that happen. Um, but I'm gonna I'll, I'll sign off for now. I'll say thank you very much for watching. We we'll look forward to seeing you again real soon. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everyone.